Well, thank you, Lord Jesus. Um, so this is uh, Bradley's second week at his new church. I checked in with him, been praying for him. He said the first week at his new church was awesome, and it went really well. And Brad, before he left, talked about how much he learned from Valley Christian Church and how much he learned from, believe it or not, Doug and I. And uh, <laughs> But something I learned from him, which I want to continue from time to time, is how we release the... The, our kids to go to their classes. Because kids, we are so glad every one of you are here today, and we're so glad that you're at church learning about Jesus, because he is incredibly awesome, and he is our life and our love. So I want you to know, we, all the adults in here, are thankful you're here. But what we're going to do is we're going to send you off to your class, and when I count, when I get down to one, then we can go say go. But uh, three years old, kindergarten, go in the classroom over here. First to fifth grade, you're going to go out in the ark with Jane. And the sixth to eighth grade, uh, you'll go out in the ark as well with Jim. So, everybody, when I get to one, we're going to clap for the kids as they leave and, uh, and do it enthusiastically because we're thankful they are here. We send them off with our prayers. We send them off with a cheer. Three. Two, one, go! <laughs> I'm so glad that uh, Brad taught us that. I think that's the coolest thing. So, praise God. And adults, we are glad you're here too. Seriously. We're glad you're all here. So I think we have uh, today and then next week we're going to finish up uh, our series in the book of Acts called World Changers. And uh, next week Eliab is going to bring the word. And that's always really good. So we're excited about that. And he'll wrap it up, the world, cha world changers. And that's what we want to be. We want to change the world around us. So today um, I am going to talk to you about hardships and open doors hardships, and open doors. And I hope, I, get, I pray that you will hear from the Lord today and that it will make a difference in your life and that it will help you through your hardships. But I want you to hear what the Word of God says. How many of you believe that God's Word is truth? All right, praise God. I believe that God's Word is truth. So I want you to know that the New Testament church went through hardships. Very much. And so we're in Acts, the 14th chapter, if you want to go there. And I need to read this portion. Some of the scriptures I will tell you, and they'll be up there. But um, I'm not going to have time maybe to read all of them all the way through. But you'll be able to see them. Acts, the 14th chapter. It's, it's kind of a, it's almost a confusing verse. And I'll tell you why. Verse 21. They preached the good news in that city and won a large number of disciples. Then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. Now, listen to this verse. We must, quote, we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. Let me repeat. They said... We must go through hardships in order to enter the kingdom of God. Now, that is confusing to me, maybe not to you, but it is to me. Because I thought that if we accepted Jesus, that we'd enter the kingdom of God. We'll, we'll talk about that. Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in, uh, in each church, and with prayer and fasting committed them to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. After going through uh, Pisidia, they came to Pamphylia, and when they preached the word in Perga, they went down to Italia. There's a lot of strange cities. You know, Wilsonville, that's not bad to say compared to that, right? And from Italia, they sailed back to Antioch where they had been committed to the grace of God for the work they had now completed. On arriving there, 
They gathered the church together and reported all that God had done through them. And now he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. And they stayed there for a long time with the disciples. So now, here's what they're saying there. They are not saying that in order to get saved, you've got to go through hardship. That's not what they're saying. That would be inconsistent with what the Word of God teaches. Is that right? The Bible teaches us that by grace are we saved through faith that not of ourselves. It's a gift of God. It's not something we do. It's not something we go through. It's something Jesus went through for us on our behalf. Everybody agree with that? So what are they saying here? My land, he's saying, this is what they're saying. I haven't done that for a long time. Kind of feels good to come down here. Hardships. Listen hardships are part of being a believer. If you are a believer in Christ Jesus, you will go through hardship. And I've got some scriptures to share with you on that. Hardships are part of being a believer. If you're a believer in Christ Jesus, you're going to go through hardships. In John 16, Jesus says this, I have told you these things, So that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. How many say amen to that? In this world you will have trouble. The last two years ought to tell us that. In this world we'll have trouble. But take heart. I've overcome the world. That's what Jesus said. See, that's what the truth is. Let me me just outline before I get into what I think about all of this. Let me outline for you. The culture we live in. Hardships, going through hard times, and struggling through is not what's taught in a lot of places right now. A lot of places are telling you, well, if you just believe on Jesus, you just come to Jesus, your life is hunky-dory. That's not what the Bible says. Not. If you believe in Jesus, you come to Jesus, and you walk with Jesus, you're going to go through hard times. That's what the Bible says. And I believe that's truth. Now, that doesn't mean we have to focus on it, and I'll move on from this in just a second. But anybody that tells you, if you just believe in Jesus and you say the right things, you're going to be successful. Jesus did not call us to be successful. He called us to be servants. Jesus called us to serve others, not to be successful and say, look at me. There are people who teach, well, if you just come to Jesus, you'll be happy. Happy, happy, happy. Jesus didn't call us to be happy. He called us to be holy. Jesus is more interested in our holiness, not our happiness. What's interesting is in the midst of all of this, of our hardships, in the midst of that, Jesus is active. He's working. And the joy of the Lord fills our hearts. Even though we're going through hard times. Let me read a few scriptures to you. I'll try to not, I can't read all of it, but I, I'm going to get to preaching here in a minute. This gets me all excited. Look what Paul went through. I've worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes, minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned, three times shipwrecked. Ah, I'm already worn out. Verse 27, I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have gone without food. I've been cold and naked. Looks like... Paul didn't go to the right teacher because if he just would have confessed, he would have been just fine. Folks, if you're a Christian, you're going to go through hard times. Say amen. But don't fret because Jesus will get you through everything. If you read Hebrews, the 11th chapter, we don't have time to read it all. I just want to read part of it. The first part is just talking about faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of not, things not seen. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. 
And we know that. And then the writer of Hebrews talked to the, all about these great men and women of faith. Samson. Moses. Abraham. All of them. Great. Look at what they did. Look at the victories they had. And if you look down towards the end, I want you to look up there. Verse 35. Women receive back their dead, raised to life again. Watch. Others were tortured and refused to be released so they might gain a better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging while others were chained and put in prison. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were put to death by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. I don't think they read how you can be successful as a Christian. They went through incredible persecution and torture. But look what it says. Verse 38, the world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains and caves and, in the, and, and holes in the ground. They didn't have anywhere to live. They didn't have anything to eat. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what was promised. That's what it means to be a Christian. Success does not define you as a Christian or what the world defines as success. Faith, faith is what defines us. Finally, Romans says, we rejoice in our sufferings. How many of you rejoice in your sufferings? I was like, yeah, Lord, <laughs> I want to suffer. But that's what the scripture says. We, we rejoice in our suffering. This is just boggles my mind, folks. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, character, hope. Hope doesn't disappoint us because God has poured out his love in our hearts. And 2 Timothy, that scripture is up there too. Endure hardship. So here's what I'm wondering. And I made my own observations here, so they may not be your observations, but it what, it's what I learned. How did they do it? How did these people, the church, the, how did they get through, how did they do this? How, how are they willing to not have anything? How are they willing to, be, to die for their faith? How does that happen? And I came up with about four keys, what I saw. Now, you may see something different, but I'll tell you what I saw. And I want you to hear this from your heart. Some of it I'm going to talk about. It's going to kind of call all of us out a little bit. I'm just telling you. Because I'm going to speak the truth in love. I'm not going to hold back. Number one, this is one of the keys I saw. When you read through the New Testament, the book of Acts, the world changers, why were they such world changers? Why were thousands and thousands and thousands coming to, coming to Christ every day? Why was that happening? Well, Christ and his reality in their lives was overwhelming. They absolutely knew Jesus was real. Jesus the Christ, the Son of the living God, came. He lived. He died. He rose again. And they knew that was real. It was overwhelming. It wasn't some afterthought they had. Christianity to them wasn't going to church on Sunday. It was their life. Christianity and knowing Jesus, Jesus was so real to them. Sometimes, folks, I know, when I say you, I mean us, because I know there's days when Jesus isn't as real in my heart and my life as he ought to be. I know there's some days in my life, as much as I want to reflect Christ, I have not done enough experiencing God so I can reflect Christ. And when I don't do that, reflect Christ, I fail in my calling. I fail in who I am in Christ Jesus. And if I really believed all the time that Jesus was real, Jesus is right there, it would change the way I think. And it would change the way you think. Go 
got pretty quiet in here. Acts 2.42, everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They're selling their possessions, their goods, they gave to anyone that's had need. Every day, we'll get to that in a minute, they continued to meet in the temple courts so number one, Jesus was real to them. Je- the name Jesus wasn't just Jesus. It wasn't just a name. It wasn't just an, something they said. For them, praise God, wasn't just a term. It was something that came from deep within them because they knew Jesus is real. Folks, Jesus is real. His power is real. But sometimes we don't live like that. I absolutely believe that God wants us to live like he's real right now in our hearts. Secondly, their lives are completely centered around Jesus and his purpose. Completely. Every single day. Their lives were centered. In fact, it said every day they were meeting together. They were praying together. They were seeking God together. They were taking communion together. They were eating together. They did it together. So today I look out here and what a great turnout. I love seeing all of you here. This is really an encouragement to me. Because I need you. I need you and you need me, believe it or not. We need one another. The body is being fitted and held together by that which every joint supplies. We need each other. And so, Doug talked a few weeks ago about fellowship, about coming together. They met every day. And they were engaged in the word of God every day. Praising God and enjoying the favor of all people and the Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved. The pandemic was, has been awful. I don't in any way diminish or demean the impact that's had in the world. Some of you have been directly affected by that. So believe me, I'm not saying to you at all that that's no big deal. I think it is. One of the things that the pandemic did to us is we haven't done this very much. This is so awesome. What do I mean by this? We're joined together. I get to look at Kiko and Jonathan, who have been married for a week now. I I get to see my brother Robert, Scott, my sister Amanda. I get to see you in your eyeballs face to face that is such an encouragement to me and we can never ever ever diminish the importance of that I'm not asking any of us in this room or anybody watching on Facebook live not asking any of you to act in a careless manner not asking that Please use all the precautions. Please use, be cautious and take your precautions. But I can tell you this, God wants us to meet together. Now, if we we all wear masks, I'm okay with that. Well, okay. If we're all vaccinated or not, I'm not going to get into that. That's political. It's all political. But what I will get into is God wants us to be together face to face. 
And that's clear through Scripture. It's what got them through the hard times. They got through the hard times because they're getting with each other. Oh, man, can you pray for me? Help me. I need, I need some prayer. Now, you can call and do that, but there's something about being face-to-face. I, I just need to back up real quick because I missed something I really wanted to say a minute ago. And that is hardships are part of the deal. Here's what happens to a lot of you. You go through hardships and you immediately think that God's punishing you. Oh, look at This is hard. I'm going through a hard time. Now God's punishing me. Woo! I know. I've done it. Some of you have done the same thing. God's upset with me. God's not hearing me. God's left me. Does that relate to any of you? Yeah. It's none of the above. Hardships are part of walking with Jesus. Thirdly, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Read Philippians 1, 1, 21 through 26 when you get a chance. Thirdly, their lives on this earth were not as important as the life to come. See, what they lived here, what we see with our eyes, because now we see through a glass darkly, but then we shall see face to face, and then we shall know, even as we have also been fully known. That's what the Scripture says. Scripture says that uh, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, never, neither has it entered the heart of man what God has prepared for them who love him. Scripture says that the things that are seen are temporary, but the things that are unseen are eternal. And the enemy would do all he can to get us focused on this, on on, on what we see in the world around us. God wants us to see him. Those folks that were going through such hard and terrible persecution in the New Testament church, those people weren't looking at what what was now. They were looking at what was ahead. Some months ago, I remember, Doug taught about what heaven's going to be like. So I don't know exactly what it's going to look like, but I can tell you this. Heaven's way beyond what I can comprehend and understand right now. And what that does to me is it motivates me to get every single person to go to heaven while I'm still here. Because that's what God wants us to do. Finally, they knew what was coming, and they lived in a way that they expected it. So they, they knew hardship was part of it. They knew that they had something uh, coming in their lives in, in the future that was greater than what they were experiencing now. But for right now, they knew hardship was part of it. Now, I, I'm not suggesting that I have ever faced what they face. I don't think any of us have ever had to worry while we're worshiping the Lord in here that somebody would come in and and start killing us because we were worshiping God. But that happens in some places. Happened in the New Testament church. It's happening right now in some foreign countries. If you worship Jesus right now in some foreign countries, it costs you your life. Literally, your life on this earth. Done. Done. But let me follow that up with this. Some of us have faced hardship. Some of you are facing hardship right now. I asked permission for Maria, and many of you know Maria went in last week. Uh, a week ago, I don't know how it's been, I, a couple weeks, and she actually had a... a a heart, um, something with her heart, heart attack is what they said. But I love her response. She texted me, and because I was saying, hey, we're all praying for you. So you understand, here's Maria. Her husband actually is down in California right now. And she gets to live with her, I think she lives with her daughter and son-in-law. And 
her grandkids. I won't go into detail, but right now her life isn't just all hunky-dory. I will tell you that. And so she has this heart scare, and, and they take her to the hospital, and she's in there all alone. Nobody come visit her. Just all alone, just laying there for five days. Every once in a while, she sees a nurse, probably in the middle of the night, just when she's getting to sleep. I love her response. It just blesses me. She said, hello and good morning. I would like to request prayer, prayer at church today. First, please thank everyone for their prayers and well wishes, and that all goes well with the procedure that they will do tomorrow. She, this was last Sunday. So I can go home. I've been in the hospital for four days now, but I feel confident this is all within God's plan for a greater purpose. I actually feel it is a doorway to answered prayers. I've been praying for so long. It doesn't sound like it makes sense, but I know it makes sense. Thank you a lot. <laughs> Yeah, it does make sense, Maria. It really does. So she's in the hospital all alone for four days. And she says, man, this is awesome. Because it's an answered prayer. <laughs> that just blew my mind, boggled my mind. So I guess most of you know I got the, the COVID and went through that. And I, you know, I don't know if it's COVID or just whatever it was, but I can tell you that the isolation and the loneliness and everything really did affect me. Um, I'm, I'm Mr. Joyful, let's go, let's go. Let's go. And I had like not that much energy to say, let's go. My energy was really low. I also couldn't, I wasn't sleeping at night. And I actually believed this wasn't only me, but there were some others just experiencing a real attack from the enemy. I, where I'd wake up in the middle of the night just in fear. Guys, I just want you to know that's not me. That's not how I am. I'm the guy who prays for others. I'm the guy who gets others up. And guys, I just tell you, I didn't have it. And I'd have, they weren't dreams, they were nightmares. And it happened for about two weeks straight. And I went immediately and said, God, what did I do wrong? Where's my sin? What's going on? Why is this happening to me? God, I, I've got, I, I need your strength because I've got people I need to minister to. I've got people I need to reach out to. I need to be with my pastor and help him. And about 3.30, 4 a.m. one day, one morning, I woke up and I asked God that question. And so clearly, almost in an audible voice, I mean, it was so loud, I didn't hear it with my ears, but it was almost like I could. God said, this is for your good. This is so you can be more conformed to my image. This is so you, I can use you more. But when he said, this is for your good, it just, whoa. I still don't understand. It's like, can we do this a different way, God? 
Can I please get some sleep without nightmares? I, that would be really nice. Can I wake up not in fear? God, is that okay? I can tell you that that experience for me brought in my heart more compassion, more grace, more mercy, more understanding of other people and what they're going through. So I can tell you that if any of you say to me now, Mike, I'm going through some tough times, my heart is different because in that time, in and through that hardship, God changed me. He changed me to be more compassionate, to be more understanding, to be less judgmental, to be more like Jesus. Right? Let's pray. Lord God, we want to be conformed into your image. And there are people sitting in this room right now that are going through it, going through a hard time in relationships and provision and work and just in their life, just going through a hard time. First of all, Lord, we want to learn what you want to teach us through the hard time. Through the hardship, Lord, open up doors for us of ministry. Open up doors so we understand how to relate to other people. So we understand what they're going through. Open the doors, Lord. And yes, God, we thank you. In the midst of our hardship, we thank you. Because you deserve all praise, all honor, and all glory. Amen.